We'll open the phones up in this hour. We have two amazing guests together, and we really won't have time to do justice to this in the 45 minutes of airtime we have each hour, but we'll try. They were both with the Force Research Unit, covert military intelligence unit established by the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense under the British Army Special Intelligence Wing, or SIW, along with the Joint Service Schools of Intelligence, originally based in Ashford and Kent, and later moved to Chicksons uh, at uh, Bedfordshire, and we've we've covered it. Uh, sometimes you'd have both guys high level in the uh, in a whole branch of the IRA, really being British intelligence, and the two people not even knowing it. And uh, just this goes into false flag terror. It's so important. And both of our uh, guests are going to use pseudonyms, though we do know both their names. And it's uh, Kevin Fulton. And, of course, uh, there's also uh, Martin Ingram, and there have been literally hundreds of mainstream news articles written about both men in the U.S. and in England, and we're honored to have Martin Ingram and Kevin Fulton on with us today. Gentlemen, thank you. Good evening. Uh, just so people get uh, 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 learn to recognize each separate voice, can Martin Ingram say hi first? Hi, Alex. Good evening. Thank you for coming on the show with us. You're welcome. Okay, that's that's Martin, uh, and then uh, Kevin, say hi. Hi, Alex. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Yeah, I appreciate you both coming on. Uh, both of you, now, were both of you uh, what we call infiltrators? or, or uh, First off, Martin, tell us what you did. Well, I controlled the agents uh, within the IRA. I directed people like Kevin to penetrate and infiltrate uh, the IRA and commit crimes for and on behalf of the state. Commit crimes for and on behalf of the state. And uh, Kevin, what did you do? Well, Alex, I was a member, a serving member of the British Army, and I was recruited by the Force Research Unit to actually become a terrorist on behalf of Her Majesty's government. Unbelievable. Well, you definitely both boiled it down. Why are you now going public, gentlemen? Why are you speaking out? Well, I, I, from my perspective, um, I've been doing this since 1999. Um, basically, um, in a democracy, the state should not be targeting its own people. And I, I fundamentally feel that that is wrong and that uh, we should learn from the mistakes of the past, the last 30 years. And uh, I wouldn't like my children to suffer what many children in Northern Ireland suffered and in other theatres. Um, so that would be my um, motivation. You, now, now, you're quite famous. You were known as Steak Knife. Well, I, I wrote the book, Steak Knife. I exposed the agent who was a mass murderer who came, killed... Yeah, but, uh, exactly. You've been known for exposing Steak Knife, is what I should say. Yes, yes. I exposed the, the, uh, the infamous killer. Uh, who killed many tens of people, uh, and who is still to this day protected by the British state. Unbelievable. You know, I know we have a lot of laymen people who haven't researched this, and I've, I've read quite a few articles and books on the subject, and still I'm a complete buffoon when it comes to the knowledge both of you men have respectively and together. So when we get back after this break in one minute, we've got plenty of time in that segment. I'd like both of you just to roll out with the crimes that were committed uh, by Her Majesty's uh, service, uh, you know, under those orders, why they claim they were doing it, but what you think the real aim of state-sponsored terrorism is, and 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 why these false flag and i.e. Uh, uh, provocateur events do take place. Who wants to take it first when we get back? Uh, uh, perhaps Martin should go first, or Martin, do you think Kevin should go first? Uh, perhaps I'll take it first. Uh, I'll take yeah. it from the institution point of view, and then let Kevin take it from the man who actually uh, operated on the ground. Well, we appreciate both of uh, you men joining us and your courage. It takes a lot of courage to have been involved in things uh, unsavory and then later go public and expose them, and, and obviously a lot of courage because both of you men are in physical danger. Uh, and that is an understatement. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Joining us from undisclosed locations in the United Kingdom are two individuals that have become quite famous. Martin Ingram is a pseudonym used by one of the chief controlling officers who refused to go along with amazing levels of corruption and went public about British intelligence being involved in murders, crime, terrorism, you name it. And uh, then at the same time, we're also joined by Kevin Fulton. That's a pseudonym as well. 
And again, this is all over the mainstream British press. This is vetted. This is admitted. Uh, but uh, they're going a little bit further here today than they've gone in the past, and we're honored to have both of these gentlemen on. So we've got the field operative level, and then we've got the, the uh, commander uh, level with uh, Martin Ingram. Martin, you take it first. Just if you can, boil it down, condense it to what you did uh, uh, in intelligence, what you witnessed, what they told you you would be doing, and what really ended up happening and some of the crimes that were committed that you can talk about. Okay, well, effectively what Northern Ireland was, uh, was two sides, two communities, the Protestant and the Roman Catholic, to make it very simplistic. What the British government did uh, through its various agencies, but primarily by the army and the police, was to control both factions in its entirety. The leadership of the Republican community was infiltrated and the Protestant or the Loyalist community was infiltrated. Now, you just said the key thing there. Control the leadership of both entirely and literally steer and control uh, the ongoing crises. Go ahead. Well, that is fundamental to your achieving your objective. And, and uh, effectively what they did for 30 years was to have them fight each other and um, make it look to the world that the British uh, government was the honest uh, arbitrator and the honest party uh, who was basically being caught up in the middle and trying to do its best. And from when what I've taken away from what other agents in the record shows and the inquiries show is in truth they were there actually trying to stir it up as a pretext to continue uh, control over the region. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I, they, they didn't stir it. They generated it without the British government's uh, involvement and action uh, by its various agencies, there wouldn't have been the prolonged conflict. So it's worse than what I said. They, uh, I mean, to repeat what you just said, uh, they didn't stir it, they generated it. Absolutely. They, they, wow. they directed. They, they didn't. They, um, um, if your imagination couldn't run to the levels of ingenuity which was taken to, to run these sort of people. Uh, to give you an example, the man known as State Knife, Mr. Alfredo Scapatici, was run for over 30 years uh, in the capacity as the head of the internal security unit, and that is he killed people for and on behalf of the state. Now, many of the people that he killed were people who were genuinely uh, Republicans or, or uh, people who were committed to the fight, but weren't following... Uh, the doctrine which was being set by Her Majesty's government. In other words, if it didn't fit in Her Majesty's government strategy, then you were disposed of. Didn't didn't uh, individual and, and, and for listeners who just joined us, describe your role, sir, inside of this whole operation. Well, Pete, myself, uh, we would we control agents like Freddie Scappatici and others who um, were there were tasked to commit crimes, to gather intelligence, uh, which would, in theory, allow the commanders to uh, exploit intelligence in a timely fashion to save life. That's what I joined the service for, which was to save life. Uh, and uh, what actually happened was that we took life, and it was very arbitrary uh, in as much as there wasn't... Um, uh, it wasn't very fair, let me put it that way, uh, and it didn't follow what I would expect in a normal democracy. Well, from what I've, I mean, from my research, obviously not being on the inside like both of you gentlemen were, it was just really to keep the crises going and to make sure that it never really became a serious political discussion and to keep the two sides fighting with each other as a pretext to keep British control in Northern Ireland. And that is exactly what's happened today, isn't it? Because, you know, effectively the Republican movement today has been uh, uh, neutered. It, well, it's not been neutered, it's been defeated in its entirety. Uh, and the, from a loyalist point of view, uh, criminality still goes on, but the, the Good Friday Agreement unbelievably respects the right of the United Kingdom to administer rule in the North. It also... Uh, uh, in, make sure that uh, the Republic of Ireland renounces its territorial claim to the north of Ireland. Have the British. Irish and, and, and British people started to see through this, sir? Uh, I say, uh, the, the, the Northern Irish community prior to 1999 uh, were uh, totally at a loss to explain what had gone on in the past. Since 1999, when people like myself and Kevin Fulton and a few others and a number of very, very good journalists like Greg Harkin 
and Liam Clark and a few other people uh, who have exposed um, certain aspects of this story. The public today are absolutely 100% believers, and, uh, which is something that I believe that you're trying to convince the American public in respect to 9-11. Oh, exactly. In fact, I mean, just out of the gates, uh, we know that our government has Operation Northwoods, an official plan to stage 9-11 style attacks. We know Gulf of Tonkin was staged, totally de uh, declassified that our government staged attacks in 53 against Iran to blame it on their government. So, uh, yes, sir, we believe 9-11 is an inside job. You want to give us your take on that? Well, I, I have met with David Shiller, and I have discussed, so I, you know, I, I'll make that clear. And I have watched um, some of the, um, the video footage of the attacks. I, I would say, I, I would caution, uh, from, my, from my perspective, that I don't know enough about it, but what I would say is there are very many questions which would require to be answered in a very uh, explicit and detailed way. Before so you do I, smell a rat then? Uh, yeah, there are certain aspects of this that I think do, des well, th they don't deserve, but I would demand uh, answers to them. If I'd lost a loved one in, in that sure. uh, incident, then I would be um, sure. absolutely fundamentally in favour of a, we call it a public inquiry, uh, but a open inquiry into all that. Sure, we know there's been a cover-up, but the first step would be a real investigation. We're talking to one of the commanders from the Force Research Unit, Covert Military mm -hmm. Intelligence, Unit established uh, running operations in Northern Ireland and, of course, in areas of England. Uh, and, uh, gentlemen, how far can you go in saying w what your role was? Well, you know, before we do that, and I also want to give Kevin a chance to pop in here and say some things here in just a moment, but, but uh, continuing with, with uh, Martin Ingram. Martin, what did you see in 99, or what was the string of things you witnessed that made you finally go public? Well, in, in essence, what it is is that we are um, we are being fed a, a lie, and I dislike the public being lied to, and ultimately the victims deserve to be told the truth. We're in a period now in Northern Ireland where there isn't going to be a conflict, another conflict. Uh, this generation has been defeated. So it's, it's incumbent upon the, uh, the government, and there has been three governments, uh, principally, during this conflict, who uh, should hold their hands up and accept the blame and the responsibility. And also people like myself also have to accept responsibility uh, at the coal face because we all have a, uh, the right to say no. I didn't say no, uh, but, you know, clearly um, what we did was wrong. 99% of our operations I have no problem with and I would defend. But it, the one percent. Let's get into that one percent. I mean, I've got all the articles here in front of me, but it's better to hear it directly from from the people who witnessed it. Uh, what type of criminal activities are we talking about? Mass murder. Would you like to give us an example of one of the famous cases, or hey, if Kevin would like to pop in, give us an example of anything he witnessed? Well, l let me give you an example of, say, the human bomb, the strategy of. Uh, of uh, using a human being as a proxy bomb, I suppose uh, very similar to a suicide bomb in it, but, it, but where you strap or you contain an individual. But, but Kevin is, is ideally placed to give you an insight into that because he was involved in that type of an operation. Uh, yes, sir. Please tell us, uh, uh, Kevin Fulton, give us just kind of a bird's eye view of what uh, Martin's talking about. Since I released the book actually just there in June, and since June, the police have now started a criminal investigation into my activities. So a lot of the stuff I can't go into in exact detail, but what I can say is IRA operations, there were a number of agents involved in operations, and these people were agents for the British state uh, in the human bomb attacks, which killed soldiers, innocent civilians, also landmine attacks. I mean... Listen, the best way to put it to your listeners is I was a soldier recruited to go into the IRA. Basically, in my capacity as a British agent, I became a terrorist. Now, you can't pretend to be a terrorist. You know, I had to be able to do the same thing as the man next to me was doing. I'm not going to go into specifics, but I mean, just listen to what I'm saying. 
You know, that's exactly what it is. I mean, I was in operations and they were basically frustrated. No target turned up. Sometimes operations they got, things didn't go to plan. And I think you should be able to read into that again. I mean, this interview that I'm doing you now will be used against me by the British authorities. You know, uh, so well, I would imagine they're pretty upset that you're going public right now, aren't they? Well, the, the thing is, I had no other choice. They tried to have me killed. You know, I work for internal security for the IRA as well, along with Mr. Scabatici. I mean, my own people in the government, someone took the decision to have me murdered. I had outlived my usefulness, and the best way to, to look at it now is, I see it now since I'm away from it, they had to tie up loose ends. Now, I had friends, who I still have friends in the intelligence community, who tipped me off. They had saved my life. But, I mean, well, well, stay there. We've got a break. When we come back, I want to hear about how your, your life's in danger. And... Uh then I can go over a few of the cases that are admitted and now now public. But we're talking about state-sponsored terror, talking about the government staging attacks, blaming it on enemies. We're talking about the government literally leading the IRA, leading the Orange, leading both sides, leading them into conflict as a pretext to keep the military in place in Northern Ireland. We'll be right back. During the break, I was looking at martiningram.blogspot.com and other websites that uh, have photos and documents up there from Kevin Fulton and Martin Ingram. Pictures of British intelligence officers that posed as the leaders of groups like Sinn Féin. Uh, just, just amazing stuff. The photos we're looking at, gentlemen, uh, can you describe some of the images that I've been looking at that we've got linked to up on InfoWars? Uh, dot com, uh, Kevin, and can you uh, relay to us how much danger you guys are in for going public? Well, do you want me to go first, Alex? Uh, yes, sir, please. Right, well, I mean, I'm not near my computer. Some of the, the photographs up there, there may be some of the dead agents lying at the side of the road. Uh, I don't know whether you've linked to those. Uh, those were three guys, Dignan, Stars, and Burns. These were three British agents. Uh, they had warned their handlers that they were compromised, they needed to be pulled out, and someone within the force research unit, uh, Colonel Kerr, he took the decision, let them go, let them die. Now, they were abducted by the IRA internal security unit, and now, I wasn't involved in that operation, but they were basically lifted. Mr. Scapatici, who was agent steak knife, would have been there. He would have been yeah, there. let's uh, let's be clear. We have people who are British intelligence heading up IRA internal security. Uh, that's a key point. I mean, we're talking about leadership on both sides. The groups not just being infiltrated, but being led by British intel. Uh, break that down for us. Well, the thing is, I was involved in the internal security unit. I was a driver. Now, I mean, everything I learned went back to my handlers. Now, I didn't know that Agent State Knife, who was there present as well, was also an agent. You know, no one knows what the man next to him is. Yeah, I treated everybody as my enemy. So basically, people's lives could have been saved and weren't. That's exactly just what it is. They picked and choose who they wanted to die, which was, sounds terrible, in intelligence circles, it's a logical thing to do when you conduct black operations. You know, that is the way... I was set up in another operation. I didn't even see it coming until someone friendly in the service actually warned me not to go back. And that's when I had to go running, and that's when I exposed everything. So the government yeah, because, asked you, uh, recruited you out of the Army to go do all of this and then tried to just cut you loose? Absolutely, yes. I mean, my government, we even got the stage of I helped develop triggers for bombs, I had developed bombs for the IRA. I mean, at one time, because the Army had jamming devices to stop radio signals, I mean, this is used everywhere, the IRA started to work on a flash unit. Now, I was actually asked to go to New York to buy some of these units in New York. Now, my MI5 military handlers and one special branch officer arranged, you know, for safe passage for me to go to New York, which I did. When we met there, there was FBI and Secret Service people there with my handlers. You know, uh, I met up with another bomb maker who was on the run from the provisional IRA. He was living in New York illegally. They had lost him, and I basically met up with him for dinner. And, you know, the FBI people picked him up later on to try to recruit him as an agent. 
I mean, this is another thing that it makes sense to me now. At the time, you know, I was in the middle of things. I, I wasn't seeing fairly. And I was a willing tool of the government. Uh, you know, I would target people who were killing people as well, and I would tell my handlers, think that these people would be arrested on a job, on an operation. It did happen sometimes, but other times these people were recruited. So instead of locking these people up, they actually recruited real terrorists and made them their agents. You know, it's... It was a sure, circle. that's the type of people the government wants, and then you're a real live agent. You're just a you know nobody to them, and they try to cut loose later, and then you've got government out sponsoring terror. Uh, how many cases were you aware of, both of you gentlemen, where the government cooked the bomb or, or trained the driver or let the attack go forward for political gain? Well, one that springs to mind straight away, I mean, I wasn't involved with the bomb that went off in Oma. But just before that bomb, on a number of occasions before that, I met the same guy, Manny, the ombudsman called him, and he was making bombs. So I would tell my handler, and sure enough, within two or three days, a bomb would go off locally. Three days before the bomb went off in Oma, I met this guy again, uh, just about ten past twelve after midnight, and he, he was mixing the bomb. I mean, this guy is an agent as well. He was my... I was, he was my boss in the IRA. He taught me everything. So your boss in the IRA is a government agent, too, and he's making the bomb that they go, and then, of course, the Omaha bomb killed a bunch of people. The Omaha so bomb killed people, people. yeah. Uh, uh, say that number again for folks that missed it. Pardon? Oh, 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 30, 30 people. Yeah, 30 people. Yeah. Hey, but don't worry. I get to put up some more cameras, take some more freedoms, put some more troops on the streets. Learn to worship the government. Okay, th th this was a short segment, gentlemen. Long segment coming up, plenty of time to talk. And I'd like you both to just have a free-for-all. Go back and forth and let's get it all out there. And hopefully this can stop more of this activity in the future. Because disclosing this uh, makes the government suspend their actions. When Martin Ingram and now Kevin Fulton and many others started going public in the late 1990s, you notice that IRA bombings just suddenly went away. You notice that the pretext for the occupation of Northern Ireland suddenly ended. This is why disclosure is so important. Because when you've got both sides led and controlled, and, and the cases of where low-level IRA who weren't government agents, who really were terrorists, you know, getting kneecapped, getting beat up, getting killed because they refuse to go out and kill people. Imagine British agents, get out there and kill, kill. And they think it's their IRA commanders. Uh, it's just so sick. And it's the same thing we've seen in this country, Israel, everywhere. It's It's horrible. And it's order out of chaos. That's what we're talking about here. Going back to Kevin Fulton and, of course, Martin Ingram, uh, just so people know who Martin is, Martin Ingram is the pseudonym for the ex-British Army soldier who served in the Intelligence Corps and Force Research Unit. And uh, he has uh, really exposed the British Army, its operations in Northern Ireland via the Force Research Unit and against uh, features in the Provisional Irish Republican Army, or PIRA. And uh, we're going to just leave it right there. Uh, I've got the encyclopedia here, and it's got more on his name and information, but we're not going to give you his name here on air today. We do have links to both these gentlemen's websites, their blogs, where you can learn more about what they're saying and doing. And uh, they have really stopped a lot of further killing. Uh, gentlemen, and either one of you can take this first. Is my outside analysis and view of this correct, that as soon as uh, the fact that British intelligence was running the operations came out, that we saw an, an almost end or a, 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 a major drop-off down to almost nothing of terrorist attacks in Northern Ireland and England, uh, supposedly from the IRA? Well, can I take that one first, Kevin? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well... Yes, a little bit too simplistic, Alex, and I'll explain why. Um, the, prior to 99, the, the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 98. Effectively, the war in the north was actually finished by the very early 90s, the 92 to 96 period. We saw the odd mainland bombing at Docklands in London and Canary Wharf. 
The, but they were, again, committed and directed by agents. But it, what effectively happened... Hold on, was, hold on. The bombing uh, that you just mentioned at Canary Wharf c carried out by British agents. Yeah, and also the, the Manchester bombing and uh, the police in Manchester were actually stopped. They actually had forensic evidence against the bombers and uh, very controversially have been uh, stopped, politically stopped from mounting a prosecution against the bombers uh, who in, again were agents of the state. Uh, so, you know, uh, you could argue why that bombing was carried out, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day it was carried out and the state has now uh, decided that it, um, it does not want to prosecute those involved. Primarily because so why did this come out then? The operations were kind of ending and they wanted to tie up loose ends and you guys didn't feel like getting killed? Uh, not so much getting killed. No, it came about because uh, once we, well, for one thing we've got the Internet, so the control of, uh, of information is very difficult because what I would say, and it is very crucial uh, to the overall uh, conflict, was that the, the British government had control over the media. And, and just may I pick up on the point that Kevin raised sure. just before the break about OMA and, uh, and the OMA bombing, happened, yeah. The, the OMA bombing. Well, the, the, the British government decided that it would uh, leak certain information to the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which has a phenomenal re uh, uh, sort of uh, reputation. Total government the, front well, going back to George Arwell's day. Absolutely. Now, what, what they did effectively, they, they have a very uh, high-profile program called Panorama. You have a similar sort of program in the States, and it's the number one flagship. And their number it's like one, 60 Minutes. It's exactly like 60 Minutes. And they have their number one reporter, a guy, a gentleman who I know very well, called John Ware. Now, John Ware, his integrity is beyond reproach. But basically, he was fed information, and uh, as Kevin outlined, the bomb maker in the Oma bombing, a man, uh, he calls him Man A, I will call him by his real name, Patrick Joseph Mooch Blair. And he uh, basically, his telephone was used within 30 seconds of the bombing going off. The location where it went off, he, his phone was used within 30 seconds. And they deliberately did not tell the journalists involved in the Panorama program because they wanted to keep the attention away from the agent who both uh, committed the bomb and also constructed the bomb. Now, the journalist was um, given this information subsequently and uh, he was mystified as to why he was not fed that information. Now, what it does go to show is that they, uh, the government want total control over the media. And I would imagine that's the same in the States. Uh, but it is becoming more and more uh, difficult to control because the advent of the Internet has made it almost impossible. I myself have a blog. You have a blog. Kevin has a means of getting information out. Uh, so the old, the old ways of dealing with the situation, frankly, have had to go um, with the Cold War. It's gone, and they're having to design and devise different ways of maintaining that control. Okay, well, at the risk of being too simplistic again, and you can correct me and, and, and uh, enlighten me here, and then I also want to get uh, Kevin uh, Fulton's response to all that's been said here and any other caveats or addendums or points he thinks are salient and central for uh, the people to you know get a good panoramic view, uh, pun intended. Yes. Looking at this, looking at what Western intelligence does over and over again, you've got pure government-sponsored terror where the government totally carries out attacks. Then you've got real terrorist attacks that are pretty pretty rare, but they do happen where it is, you know, independent groups. But, but the most common is the provocateur where the terrorists are led by government agents, handled by government agents, given weapons by government agents, and then they go out and carry out attacks, and the agents are kept safe, and then even their main terrorists are kept safe, and some normally mentally retarded patsy is sent down the river. Uh, the, the majority of bombings in England in the last 30, 40 years which of the three uh, type attacks are the most common? Uh, I mean, just give me your dead reckoning. Which percentage are real terror attacks? What percentage are provocateur? And what percentage are total government? Well, just to, just to just to give you an overview of that situation, 
the IRA was armed by the Libyans, and the uh, uh, the Protestants were armed by a major shipment from South Africa. Now, both shipments, that is the IRA's Libyan one and the Protestants uh, from the South Africa, were both controlled and uh, allowed to proceed by agents. They were directly of course, yeah. involved. So it's now, provocateur action, okay. Absolutely. Now, to answer your question about the, the, the majority of high-profile attacks on the mainland, a large proportion, I wouldn't like to put a percentage, but certainly well over 60 or 70 percent, would have been uh, involved the use of agents and um, would certainly have been preventable if you didn't have the long-term interest of but your that 60, 70 percent, what percentage of those are pure government ops versus provocateur or, or shepherded? Well, I would always say that they were government ops because ultimately a lot I of... I agree. No, no, certainly I agree. I was trying to separate the two. Absolutely. Well, it's very difficult. You, 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 I don't think you should... Um, separate the two because ultimately the government. Well, the reason I do is the public gets confused. They they go, but there's a real terrorist. Okay, well there's agents, but they just can't understand it. So I try to. Uh, and yeah, I'm not yeah. being patronizing. I mean, oh, I'm, I, most of my audience is smarter than I am. I'm trying to. Yeah. I, I, I'm just trying to let people see how this happens. Yeah, I, I accept what you're saying. It's just that you know, from an insider's point of view, it, it, there is very little difference. You could get a cigarette paper between the two. No, no, I agree with you. I, listen, I totally agree. But uh, and, and uh, you guys are the experts. You've been quiet, Kevin. You've got the floor. Give us your take on everything. Well, just to explain it there. I mean, there's a lot of operations I went on, and I knew I was an agent. I didn't know the other people with me, and my handlers would know what operation was coming up, and we we did save lives. And as I said before, sometimes. The plan didn't go to plan. Now, I've learned since coming away from those things, a lot of the other people who were planning these jobs have also now turned out to be agents as well. So, I mean, there is, there's a very fine line. I think most operations were uh, basically a duty. All young provocateurs were there. They were helping out. We were allowed to go ahead with things. You know, people lost lives. A lot of people were saved. And I don't think you can distinguish, when you're saying there about government ops or proper terrorists, there's always proper terrorists. But always watch the man next beside him. There's always an agent in somewhere. So, you know, so there is government control. I've seen operations basically frustrated. The IRA didn't know what was hitting them. And I've seen operations that did go ahead. And, I mean, I would not have known in advance, so I couldn't tell my handlers, but I would tell them afterwards. And things were covered up. I mean, there was collusion in every aspect. Well, bottom line, the state stood to gain from having terror as a pretext to scare the population into submission. Uh, Kevin, at what point did you decide to go public? At what? I mean, did it happen gradually, or did you just wake up one morning and say, that's it, I'm going public? No, I'll tell you, actually, listen, I have to say, I have to accept my responsibility. I was a willing tool of the state as a soldier. I was in a compartment. I thought I was doing right fighting terrorists and when they tried to actually hit, they had, my own bosses in the intelligence services tried to have me killed by agent steak knife they set up a complete operation that, and everybody was caught the IRA men were caught but you were but a good they, agent I mean you I mean, you were going along to get along why did they try to have steak knife kill you well the best way to put it Alex is I know too much that's exactly what it is I am a loose end and I have gone Well, that public. shows, so, so basically you've gone public because for no reason they tried to kill you. And, and, and see, folks, that shows uh, how criminal this system is, is they'll just kill, try to kill and kill their own agents. How many people have been killed? I've been researching this. I'm seeing all these photos of dead, tortured bodies of agents. How many people do you know of that, that your government's killed uh, who were agents? Martin, you take that one. You would be more into the amount of agents that were killed. Well, many, many, um, I can think of, um, well, one of the most famous ones was one of my agents, a man called Frank Hegarty. We were responsible, Frank Hegarty was responsible for bringing in a very large shipment of Libyan arms, uh, and uh, ultimately it was the largest ever find of arms on the island of Ireland. And he was killed by an agent, uh, by State Knife and by Martin McGuinness. Uh, and who were working together. And effectively, um, 
there are many, many other agents, uh, Ruby Davidson, you know, there are loads and loads of agents who've been killed by other agents. Uh, another one, um, who, Martin McGartland, who was taken to be killed, and he threw himself out of a third floor uh, set of flats very high up and uh, basically saved his life by running through a glass pane of window. Uh, there are many, many incidents of it. But just to come back... Yeah, to so they were grabbing on him going, come with us, and he went, no, boom, out the window. Yeah, they, they had him for a number of hours. They were waiting for the killers to come and, uh, and basically kill him. And he thought better of it, and he was tied up, trussed like a turkey. And being very brave and very stubborn, he decided that he wasn't going to die. So he threw himself out of Or at least don't die the way they want to. Go hobble or, over to the window and jump out, yeah. Absolutely. He took a running jump at it. But just to give your viewers an insight into the, to the level of infiltration, uh, one of the most high-profile killings in the North, and I'm certain you've heard of it, is the murder of Mr. Patrick Finucane. Sure, yeah. The, the, the lawyer, the, uh, uh, basically, out of the nine people that committed that murder, seven, seven are agents of the state. And why did the government want him dead? Well, it's not so much the government. But I know, the criminal the, elements within the state. Yeah, criminal elements within the state, because he upset a lot of people within the police and uh, other agencies by defending the rights of, um, of IRA men. Basically, he was doing his job, uh, but that, you know, effectively was a problem to the state and the state. Um, well, I think right here is the problem with having soldiers involved in domestic activities. Soldiers are trained to go kill people. They're not trained to be police. And you start putting soldiers into domestic operations, they're going to start killing people. Yeah, but in that state, in that instance, that was police, not not soldiers. Really? So it was the police. Yeah, that's right. That was that was the police, you see. Uh, well, then it never ends. It just, I mean, uh, what do you think about the setup of domestic uh, militarized police here in the U.S. and secret police and secret arrest and secret torture and the president openly talking about it? Well, it's certainly, uh, you have moved away from s some of your fundamental principles, which your democracy is built on, and you do have a Bill of Rights where we don't have a Bill of Rights in the United Kingdom. Um, and effectively, you know, your, um, uh, your rights are enshrined in law. Kevin, what do you think of what's happening in, in uh, this country? Well, I mean, the one aspect, yes, I believe in law and order, but, I mean, who watches law and order? My boss in MI5 used to have a saying. They used to have great sayings, and I always remember, and he used to say, governments can come and go, but we are always here. And I always remember that, but I mean, there are a lot of good policemen, a lot of good everybody, but there is other people who make the season who, you know, you don't see. You know, I found that out the hard way, but thankfully I'm still here at the moment. But I mean, I couldn't see the wood for the trees. So you, you know, were in the middle of it going along until they just decided to kill you to get rid of you? Absolutely, yeah. And now what they're doing now is, since I released the book came out, Unsung Hero, uh, I didn't choose the title, by the way. I mean, I don't class myself as a hero. But uh, they have now started a criminal investigation into my activities. I mean, we're seeing in the newspapers where uh, the United States government and the British government accused Iran of uh, supplying the, this infrared technology to the, you know, these, the, the insurgents. Yes, yeah, the Iraq. Well, the thing is, Greg Harkin uh, spoke to myself as a journalist to expose this stuff, and he exposed it in the British newspapers that the IRA basically developed it. The British government and the Americans helped an agent of the state, which was me, to purchase the stuff and bring it back, and the IRA shared it out. Now, the British government then had to withdraw that comment. That's right, and, and, and so a lot of the bombs overseas in the Middle East, they're not being triggered by cell phones, it's triggered by yeah. infrared, correct? A lasing? It's by infrared beams, yeah, infrared light flashes and infrared beams, they do a number of things. Telephones, you see, they can put out, block the signals. That's why the IRA developed but you can't, it. And, but you can't block line of sight lasing. No, you can't. They're trying to get a way around it, and they cannot find a way around it. Light is a frequency of light, and, you know, some of the ones, some of the stuff that I got in New York, it was uh, coded infrared. You punched in a code in your transmitter and the receiver. If the code didn't match, it wouldn't work. Now, these were innocent things for photography. But uh, they were re-engineered to set off bombs. Yeah, so, you, so you're saying right now that didn't come in from Iran? No, that came from 
I have the British intelligence. Yeah, of course. Of course the bombs are British intelligence in Iraq, or at least that's where it came from. I mean, look at British SAS got caught dressed up like Arabs with beards, running around with bombs, shooting people. In fact, let me ask you guys about that, what happened in Basra late last year. When we get back in the final segment, and then tell us about the book, too. Don't forget, folks, that we have a daily podcast of all three hours of the live show. And as soon as the broadcast ends each day of your podcast subscriber at InfoWars.com, it will be sent to your MP3 player, your iPod, whatever the case may be, as they say. So please go to InfoWars.com and just click on subscribe to the podcast. It's absolutely free and get the show delivered to you each and every day. Uh, we also re-air the show throughout uh, the day, 24 hours a day. You can tune in and uh, hear the program airing consecutively every three hours back-to-back at InfoWars.com. And that's how you can always tune in and listen. We have a lot of great affiliates across the country, but stations come and stations go. But the Internet, we hope, will always be there for you. Uh, the broadcast is almost over. I know we had a lot of callers who were holding, but that was on other issues. We, we can't go to your calls. Uh, and I appreciate bo- the courage of both these men to go public uh, here on the broadcast uh, to great danger to themselves. But you've heard them to be more dangerous to not go public. Uh, Martin Ingram and, of course, uh, Kevin Fulton. We have links to websites and news sources that have photos and documents and information. Uh, Kevin, tell us a little bit more about that book. Can we get that from what? Uh, Amazon.co.uk, or is that available too here in the U.S.? It's Amazon.co.uk. It's Unsung Hero by Kevin Fulton. And as I say, I didn't pick the title. You know, I would never... I understand. That's the publisher. Know. But but, but uh, I know you're not saying you're a hero, but yeah, you no, are going no. public, and that is heroic. Uh, absolutely, folks should get the book. I hear it's pretty powerful. Uh, in closing, gentlemen, any other key points people should be made aware of? Always keep asking questions. Never take anything you're told for granted. That's what I, I, would, say. I would concur with that. Uh, the most obvious point is not always the one that's in your face. Always look behind the curtain. Start uh, questioning a little bit. Start uh, not being so gullible. I, listen, I, that's my motto because I am just amazed by the crimes. Take your government, my government, Project Shad. We, we did that together. They take our own troops and nerve gas, innocent troops, to death just to see what nerve gas would do. I mean, how can we trust anything these governments do? Very true. I don't know how so many criminals have gotten into government and basically set up their own little empires, but it's it's bad. But as Kevin uh, outlined a few minutes ago, uh, it's not so much the governments, because governments can be removed at... Uh, Bureaucracy. But it's the, it's the uh, in, well, in our system, it's the civil service, uh, which is there forever and day, and that is what really runs the government. Well, the government thinks it's running the, the, the country, but effectively the civil service runs the government. Well, I agree with you. And then you've got the private global corporate interests that come in and pay off and manipulate the civil service. Abs- well, they, they manipulate the system, full stop. Uh, and, and in today's uh, globalization, they're becoming uh, the most powerful component uh, of all. Absolutely. Martin Ingram, we've got links to your blog. Any other uh, things we should go visit? Well, um, if you go and visit Sinn Féin's website, uh, you will basically be visiting a, a another section of the British government. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and that's why these people are in control, because they're masters at controlling all sides. And we need to realize that. Well, gentlemen, I hope to get you back up in the future to have a longer talk and take calls. Thank you for spending time with us this evening. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Alex. And Thank be careful. I'll say it for... Sorry, go ahead. Just saying good evening to your listeners, and thanks for having us on. Good evening to you. Take care and Godspeed. I'll... We should all pray for you. Well, there you are. Most of the bombings are carried out by the government. And uh, Martin Ingram was one of the commanders. And then we also have it from the low level with Kevin Fulton. Both recruited out of the Army, both patriotic men. And uh, there they were telling you the government stages most of the terror. Just like they staged 9-11, just like they'll stage the next event. Don't worry, they'll have some stupid Arab to drag out and blame for it. And The real target is you and your freedoms and your liberties, so you better get Terror Storm and make copies and get it out to everybody. Terror Storm, available at InfoWars.com. God bless you all.